Section two of The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Custom House continued. I doubt greatly, or rather, I do not doubt at all, whether any public functionary of the United States, either in the civil or military line, has ever had such a patriarchal body of veterans under his orders as myself. The whereabouts of the oldest inhabitant was at once settled when I looked at them. For upwards of twenty years before this epoch, the independent position of the collector had kept the Salem Custom House out of the whirlpool of political vicissitude, which makes the tenure of office generally so fragile. A soldier, New England's most distinguished soldier, he stood firmly on the pedestal of his gallant services, and, himself secure in the wise liberality of the successive administrations through which he had held office, he had been the safety of his subordinates in many an hour of danger and heartquake. General Miller was radically conservative, a man over whose kindly nature habit had no slight influence, attaching himself strongly to familiar faces, and with difficulty moved to change, even when change might have brought unquestionable improvement. Thus, on taking charge of my department, I found few but aged men. They were but ancient sea-captains for the most part, who, after being tossed on every sea, and standing up sturdily against life's tempestuous blast, had finally drifted into this quiet nook, where, with little to disturb them, except the periodical terrors of a presidential election, they one and all acquired a new lease of existence. Though by no means less liable than their fellow-men to age and infirmity, they had evidently some talisman or other that kept death at bay. Two or three of their number, as I was assured, being gouty and rheumatic, or perhaps bedridden, never dreamed of making their appearance at the custom-house during a large part of the year. But, after a torpid winter, would creep out into the warm sunshine of May or June, go lazily about what they termed duty, and, at their own leisure and convenience, betake themselves to bed again. I must plead guilty to the charge of abbreviating the official breath of more than one of these venerable servants of the Republic. They were allowed, on my representation, to rest from their arduous labours, and soon afterwards, as if their sole principle of life had been zeal for their country's service, as I verily believe it was, withdrew to a better world. It is a pious consolation to me that, through my interference, a sufficient space was allowed them for repentance of the evil and corrupt practices into which, as a matter of course, every custom-house officer must be supposed to fall. Neither the front nor the back entrance of the custom-house opens on the road to paradise. The greater part of my officers were Whigs. It was well for their venerable brotherhood that the new surveyor was not a politician, and, though a faithful Democrat in principle, neither received nor held his office with any reference to political services. Had it been otherwise, had an active politician been put into this influential post, to assume the easy task of making head against a Whig collector, whose infirmities withheld him from the personal administration of his office, hardly a man of the old corps would have drawn the breath of official life within a month after the exterminating angel had come up the custom-house steps. According to the received code in such matters, it would have been nothing short of duty, in a politician, to bring every one of those white heads under the axe of the guillotine, it was plain enough to discern that the old fellows dreaded some such discourtesy at my hands. It pained, and at the same time amused me, to behold the terrors that attended my advent, to see a furrowed cheek, weather-beaten by half a century of storm, turn ashy pale at the glance of so harmless an individual as myself, to detect, as one or another addressed me, the tremor of a voice, which— in long past days, had been wont to bellow through a speaking-trumpet, hoarsely enough to frighten Boreas himself to silence. They knew, these excellent old persons, that, by all established rule, and, as regarded some of them, 
weighed by their own lack of efficiency for business, they ought to have given place to younger men, more orthodox in politics, and altogether fitter than themselves to serve our common uncle. I knew it, too, but could never quite find in my heart to act upon the knowledge. Much and deservedly to my own discredit, therefore, and considerably to the detriment of my official conscience, they continued, during my incumbency, to creep about the wharves and loiter up and down the custom-house steps. They spent a good deal of time, also, asleep in their accustomed corners, with their chairs tilted back against the walls, awaking, however, once or twice in the forenoon, to bore one another with the several thousandth repetition of old sea-stories and mouldy jokes that had grown to be passwords and countersigns among them. The discovery was soon made, I imagine, that the new surveyor had no great harm in him. So, with lightsome hearts and the happy consciousness of being usefully employed, in their own behalf at least, if not for our beloved country, these good old gentlemen went through the various formalities of office. Sagaciously under their spectacles did they peep into the holds of vessels. Mighty was their fuss about little matters, and marvellous, sometimes, the obtuseness that allowed greater ones to slip between their fingers. Whenever such a mischance occurred, when a wagon-load of valuable merchandise had been smuggled ashore, at noonday perhaps, and directly beneath their unsuspicious noses, nothing could exceed the vigilance and alacrity with which they proceeded to lock and double-lock, and secure with tape and sealing-wax, all the avenues of the delinquent vessel. Instead of a reprimand for their previous negligence, the case seemed rather to require a eulogium on their praiseworthy caution after the mischief had occurred, a grateful recognition of the promptitude of their zeal, the moment that there was no longer any remedy. Unless people are more than commonly disagreeable, it is my foolish habit to contract a kindness for them. The better part of my companion's character, if it have a better part, is that which usually comes uppermost in my regard, and forms the type whereby I recognise the man. As most of these old custom-house officers had good traits, and as my position in reference to them, being paternal and protective, was favourable to the growth of friendly sentiments, I soon grew to like them all. It was pleasant in the summer forenoons, when the fervent heat, that almost liquefied the rest of the human family, merely communicated a genial warmth to their half-torpid systems. It was pleasant to hear them chatting in the back entry, a row of them all tipped against the wall as usual, while the frozen witticisms of past generations were thawed out, and came bubbling with laughter from their lips. Externally, the jollity of aged men has much in common with the mirth of children. The intellect, any more than a deep sense of humour, has little to do with the matter. It is, with both, a gleam that plays upon the surface, and imparts a sunny and cheery aspect alike to the green branch and grey, mouldering trunk. In one case, however, it is real sunshine, in the other it more resembles the phosphorescent glow of decaying wood. It would be sad injustice, the reader must understand, to represent all my excellent old friends as in their dotage. In the first place, my coadjutors were not invariably old. There were men among them in their strength and prime, of marked ability and energy, and altogether superior to the sluggish and dependent mode of life on which their evil stars had cast them. Then, moreover, the white locks of age were sometimes found to be the thatch of an intellectual tenement in good repair. But, as respects the majority of my corps of veterans, there will be no wrong done if I characterise them generally as a set of wearisome old souls, who had gathered nothing worth preservation from their varied experience of life. They seemed to have flung away all the golden grain of practical wisdom which they had enjoyed so many opportunities of harvesting, and most carefully to have stored their memory with the husks. They spoke with far more interest and unction of their morning's breakfast, or yesterday's, to-day's, or to-morrow's dinner, than of the shipwreck of forty or fifty years ago, and all the world's wonders which they had witnessed with their youthful eyes. 
the father of the Custom House, the patriarch not only of this little squad of officials, but, I am bold to say, of the respectable body of tide-waiters all over the United States, was a certain permanent inspector. He might truly be termed a legitimate son of the revenue system, dyed in the wool, or rather born in the purple, since his sire, a revolutionary colonel, and formerly collector of the port, had created an office for him, and appointed him to fill it, at a period of the early ages which few living men can now remember. This inspector, when I first knew him, was a man of fourscore years or thereabouts, and certainly one of the most wonderful specimens of wintergreen that you would be likely to discover in a lifetime's search. With his florid cheek, his compact figure smartly arrayed in a bright-buttoned blue coat, his brisk and vigorous step, and his hale and hearty aspect, altogether he seemed, not young indeed, but a kind of new contrivance of Mother Nature in the shape of man, whom age and infirmity had no business to touch. His voice and laugh, which perpetually re-echoed through the custom-house, had nothing of the tremulous quaver and cackle of an old man's utterance. They came strutting out of his lungs, like the crow of a cock or the blast of a clarion. Looking at him merely as an animal, and there was very little else to look at, he was a most satisfactory object, from the thorough healthfulness and wholesomeness of his system, and his capacity, at that extreme age, to enjoy all, or nearly all, the delights which he had ever aimed at or conceived of. The careless security of his life in the custom-house, on a regular income, and with but slight and infrequent apprehensions of removal, had no doubt contributed to make time pass lightly over him. The original and more potent causes, however, lay in the rare perfection of his animal nature, the moderate proportion of intellect, and the very trifling admixture of moral and spiritual ingredients, these latter qualities indeed being in barely enough measure to keep the old gentleman from walking on all fours. He possessed no power of thought, no depth of feeling, no troublesome sensibilities, nothing, in short, but a few commonplace instincts, which, aided by the cheerful temper which grew inevitably out of his physical well-being, did duty very respectably, and to general acceptance, in lieu of a heart. He had been the husband of three wives, all long since dead, the father of twenty children, most of whom, at every age of childhood or maturity, had likewise returned to dust. Here, one would suppose, might have been sorrow enough to imbue the sunniest disposition through and through with a sable tinge. Not so with our old inspector. One brief sigh sufficed to carry off the entire burden of these dismal reminiscences. The next moment he was as ready for sport as any unbreached infant, far readier than the collector's junior clerk, who, at nineteen years, was much the elder and graver man of the two. I used to watch and study this patriarchal personage, with, I think, livelier curiosity than any other form of humanity there presented to my notice. He was, in truth, a rare phenomenon, so perfect, in one point of view, so shallow, so delusive, so impalpable, such an absolute nonentity in every other. My conclusion was that he had no soul, no heart, no mind, nothing, as I have already said, but instincts, and yet, withal, so cunningly had the few materials of his character been put together, that there was no painful perception of deficiency, but, on my part, an entire contentment with what I found in him. It might be difficult, and it was so, to conceive how he should exist hereafter, so earthly and sensuous did he seem. But surely his existence here, admitting that it was to terminate with his last breath, had been not unkindly given, with no higher moral responsibilities than the beasts of the field, but with a larger scope of enjoyment than theirs, and with all their blessed immunity from the dreariness and duskiness of age. One point in which he had vastly the advantage over his four-footed brethren was his ability to recollect the good dinners 
which it had made no small portion of the happiness of his life to eat. His gourmandism was a highly agreeable trait, and to hear him talk of roast meat was as appetizing as a pickle or an oyster. As he possessed no higher attribute, and neither sacrificed nor vitiated any spiritual endowment by devoting all his energies and ingenuities to subserve the delight and profit of his maw, it always pleased and satisfied me to hear him expatiate on fish, poultry, and butcher's meat, and the most eligible methods of preparing them for the table. His reminiscences of good cheer, however ancient the date of the actual banquet, seemed to bring the savour of pig or turkey under one's very nostrils. There were flavours on his palate that had lingered there not less than sixty or seventy years, and were still apparently as fresh as that of the mutton-chop which he had just devoured for his breakfast. I have heard him smack his lips over dinners, every guest at which, except himself, had long been food for worms. It was marvellous to observe how the ghosts of bygone meals were continually rising up before him, not in anger or retribution, but as if grateful for his former appreciation, and seeking to repudiate an endless series of enjoyment, at once shadowy and sensual. A tenderloin of beef, a hind-quarter of veal, a spare rib of pork, a particular chicken, or a remarkably praiseworthy turkey, which had perhaps adorned his board in the days of the elder Adams, would be remembered, while all the subsequent experience of our race, and all the events that brightened or darkened his individual career, had gone over him, with as little permanent effect as the passing breeze. The chief tragic event of the old man's life, so far as I could judge, was his mishap with a certain goose, which lived and died some twenty or forty years ago, a goose of most promising figure, but which, at table, proved so inveterately tough that the carving-knife would make no impression on its carcass, and it could only be divided with an axe and hand-saw. But it is time to quit this sketch, on which, however, I should be glad to dwell at considerably more length, because of all men whom I have ever known, this individual was fittest to be a custom-house officer. Most persons, owing to causes which I may not have space to hint at, suffer moral detriment from this peculiar mode of life. The old inspector was incapable of it, and, were he to continue in office to the end of time, would be just as good as he was then, and sit down to dinner with just as good an appetite. There is one likeness, without which my gallery of custom-house portraits would be strangely incomplete, but which my comparatively few opportunities for observation enable me to sketch only in the merest outline. It is that of the collector, our gallant old general, who, after his brilliant military service, subsequently to which he had ruled over a wild western territory, had come hither, twenty years before, to spend the decline of his varied and honourable life. The brave soldier had already numbered, nearly or quite, his threescore years and ten, and was pursuing the remainder of his earthly march, burdened with infirmities which even the martial music of his own spirit-stirring recollections could do little towards lightening. The step was palsied now, that had been foremost in the charge. It was only with the assistance of a servant, and by leaning his hand heavily on the iron balustrade, that he could slowly and painfully ascend the custom-house steps, and, with a toilsome progress across the floor, attain his customary chair by the fireplace. There he used to sit, gazing with a somewhat dim serenity of aspect at the figures that came and went, amid the rustle of papers, the administering of oaths, the discussion of business, and the casual talk of the office, all which sounds and circumstances seemed but indistinctly to impress his senses, and hardly to make their way into his inner sphere of contemplation. His countenance, in this repose, was mild and kindly. If his notice was sought, an expression of courtesy and interest gleamed out upon his features, proving that there was light within him, and that it was only the outward medium of the intellectual lamp that obstructed the rays in their passage. 
the closer you penetrated to the substance of his mind, the sounder it appeared. When no longer called upon to speak or listen, either of which operations cost him an evident effort, his face would briefly subside into its former not uncheerful quietude. It was not painful to behold this look, for, though dim, it had not the imbecility of decaying age. The framework of his nature, originally strong and massive, was not yet crumpled into ruin. To observe and define his character, however, under such disadvantages, was as difficult a task as to trace out and build up anew, in imagination, an old fortress, like Ticonderoga, from a view of its grey and broken ruins. Here and there, perchance, the walls may remain almost complete, but elsewhere may be only a shapeless mound, cumbrous with its very strength, and overgrown, through long years of peace and neglect, with grass and alien weeds. Nevertheless, looking at the old warrior with affection, for, slight as was the communication between us, my feeling towards him, like that of all bipeds and quadrupeds who knew him, might not improperly be termed so, I could discern the main points of his portrait. It was marked with the noble and heroic qualities, which showed it to be not a mere accident, but of good right, that he had won a distinguished name. His spirit could never, I conceive, have been characterised by an uneasy activity. It must, at any period of his life, have required an impulse to set him in motion. But, once stirred up, with obstacles to overcome and an adequate object to be attained, it was not in the man to give out or fail. The heat that had formerly pervaded his nature, and which was not yet extinct, was never of the kind that flashes and flickers in a blaze, but rather a deep red glow as of iron in a furnace. Weight, solidity, firmness, this was the expression of his repose, even in such decay as had crept untimely over him at the period of which I speak. But I could imagine, even then, that, under some excitement which should go deeply into his consciousness, roused by a trumpet's peal, loud enough to awaken all of his energies that were not dead, but only slumbering, he was yet capable of flinging off his infirmities like a sick man's gown, dropping the staff of age to seize a battle-sword, and starting up once more a warrior. And, in so intense a moment, his demeanour would have still been calm. Such an exhibition, however, was but to be pictured in fancy, not to be anticipated, nor desired. What I saw in him, as evidently as the indestructible ramparts of old Ticonderoga, already cited as the most appropriate simile, was the features of stubborn and ponderous endurance, which might well have amounted to obstinacy in his earlier days, of integrity that, like most of his other endowments, lay in a somewhat heavy mass, and was just as unmalleable or unmanageable as a ton of iron ore, and of benevolence, which, fiercely as he led the bayonets on at Chippewa or Fort Erie, I take to be of quite as genuine a stamp as what actuates any or all of the polemical philanthropists of the age. He had slain men with his own hand, for aught I know. Certainly they had fallen like blades of grass at the sweep of the scythe before the charge to which his spirit imparted its triumphant energy. But, be that as it might, there was never in his heart so much cruelty as would have brushed the down off a butterfly's wing. I have not known the man to whose innate kindliness I would more confidently make an appeal. Many characteristics and those two which contribute not the least forcibly to impart resemblance in a sketch, must have vanished, or been obscured, before I met the general. All merely graceful attributes are usually the most evanescent, nor does nature adorn the human ruin with blossoms of new beauty, that have their roots and proper nutriment only in the chinks and crevices of decay, as she sows wallflowers over the ruined fortress of Ticonderoga. Still, even in respect of grace and beauty, there were points well worth noting. A ray of humour, now and then, would make its way through the veil of dim obstruction, and glimmer pleasantly upon our faces, 
a trait of native elegance, seldom seen in the masculine character after childhood or early youth, was shown in the general's fondness for the sight and fragrance of flowers. An old soldier might be supposed to prize only the bloody laurel on his brow, but here was one who seemed to have a young girl's appreciation of the floral tribe. There, beside the fireplace, the brave old general used to sit, while the surveyor, though seldom, when it could be avoided, taking upon himself the difficult task of engaging him in conversation, was fond of standing at a distance and watching his quiet and almost slumberous countenance. He seemed away from us, although we saw him but a few yards off, remote, though we passed close beside his chair, unattainable, though we might have stretched forth our hands and touched his own. It might be that he lived a more real life within his thoughts than amid the unappropriate environment of the collector's office. The evolutions of the parade, the tumult of the battle, the flourish of old heroic music heard thirty years before. Such scenes and sounds, perhaps, were all alive before his intellectual sense. Meanwhile, the merchants and shipmasters, the spruce clerks and uncouth sailors, entered and departed. The bustle of this commercial and custom-house life kept up its little murmur round about him, and neither with the men, nor their affairs, did the general appear to sustain the most distant relation. He was as much out of place as an old sword, now rusty, but which had flashed once in the battle's front, and showed still a bright gleam along its blade, would have been among the inkstands, paper folders, and mahogany rulers on the deputy collector's desk. There was one thing that much aided me in renewing and recreating the stalwart soldier of the Niagara frontier, the man of true and simple energy. It was the recollection of those memorable words of his, I'll try, sir, spoken on the very verge of a desperate and heroic enterprise, and breathing the soul and spirit of New England hardihood, comprehending all perils, and encountering all. If, in our country, valour were rewarded by heraldic honour, this phrase, which it seems so easy to speak, but which only he, with such a task of danger and glory before him, has ever spoken, would be the best and fittest of all mottoes for the general's shield of arms. It contributes greatly towards a man's moral and intellectual health to be brought into habits of companionship with individuals unlike himself, who care little for his pursuits, and whose sphere and abilities he must go out of himself to appreciate. The accidents of my life have often afforded me this advantage, but never with more fullness and variety than during my continuance in office. There was one man especially, the observation of whose character gave me a new idea of talent. His gifts were emphatically those of a man of business, prompt, acute, clear-minded, with an eye that saw through all perplexities, and a faculty of arrangement that made them vanish as if by the waving of an enchanter's wand. Bred up from boyhood in the custom-house, it was his proper field of activity, and the many intricacies of business, so harassing to the interloper, presented themselves before him with the regularity of a perfectly comprehended system. In my contemplation he stood as the ideal of his class. He was, indeed, the custom-house in himself, or, at all events, the mainspring that kept its variously revolving wheels in motion. For, in an institution like this, where its officers are appointed to subserve their own profit and convenience, and seldom with a leading reference to their fitness for the duty to be performed, they must perforce seek elsewhere the dexterity which is not in them. Thus, by an inevitable necessity, as a magnet attracts steel filings, so did our man of business draw to himself the difficulties which everybody met with. With an easy condescension, and kind forbearance towards our stupidity, which, to his order of mind, must have seemed little short of crime, would he, forthwith, by the merest touch of his finger, make the incomprehensible as clear as daylight? The merchants valued him not less than we, his esoteric friends. 
His integrity was perfect. It was a law of nature with him, rather than a choice or a principle, nor can it be otherwise than the main condition of an intellect, so remarkably clear and accurate as his, to be honest and regular in the administration of affairs. A stain on his conscience, as to anything that came within the range of his vocation, would trouble such a man very much in the same way, though to a far greater degree, than an error in the balance of an account, or an ink-blot on the fair page of a book of record. Here, in a word, and it is a rare instance in my life, I had met with a person thoroughly adapted to the situation which he held. End of section 28